Now, we read the last few verses of Romans chapter 11. It's the last few versions of, in the church, what we would call Romans 9, 10, and 11. Because it talks about the relationship of the church and the Jewish people. And if you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, you'll see that there's a lot of things that Paul seems to be asking as well. For example, he asks, why does it seem that God is unjust? In Romans 9, 14, why are the Gentiles coming to faith and why of Israel not? Romans 9, 30, and did Israel ever really hear the gospel message? Romans 10, verse 18. Paul does a good job of picking away at some obvious questions, and he does a good job of answering them uh, for the church in Rome. All is good, but something still is not right with Paul. Something is still bothering him. And I'll quote this from one of my favorite episodes in Colombo. He says, as the character, I worry. I mean, little things bother me. I'm a worrier. I mean, little insignificant details. I lose my appetite. I can't eat. My wife says to me, you know, you can really be a pain. And in a sense, that's how Paul is. He's asking all of these questions of a church that he has actually never even met. He's heard about them. He's writing them because he wants to come there and meet them. But things are bothering him, you know? And we see that now developed more thoroughly in Romans chapter 11. So for example, chapter 11 starts out with this question in verse one. I, I asked then, did God reject the Jewish people? He's asking that question actually even before the question was even asked by the church. Later on in Romans 11, 11, again I ask, did the Jewish people stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? He's not asking only, did God reject the Jewish people? It almost looks like they replaced them with another group of people. And then finally in Romans 11, 15, for if the rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? And today, maybe less than 2% of all Jewish people have come to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. So it almost looks like has God removed the Jewish people from his plan of spreading the gospel to the world? So these are the three questions that seem to be on his mind, okay? And there seems to be a whole mystery here. And if you would turn with me back to the beginning part of my passage, Paul asks all these questions and now I think he's going to sum up and wrap up everything and answer them at the end of Romans chapter 11. And if we look at Romans 11 verse 25, And again, this is Paul a Jew writing to a predominantly non-Jewish church in Rome. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles have come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will turn godliness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away all their sins. So, <clears throat> in 1992, there was a nonfiction book by Paul Davies called The Mind of God, subtitled The Scientific Basis for a Rational World. Its title comes from actually a quotation from Stephen Hawking. Do you know who Stephen Hawking is? He just recently passed away with one of the world's great physicists. Okay, he said this, if we do discover a theory of everything, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would truly know the mind of God. 
And it's interesting because Stephen Hawking spent his whole life being an atheist. Yet he seemed to be on some quest to find out about the mind of God, even though he probably didn't even know if he believed him or not. Okay? Interesting enough, God answers this big question with the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All he had to do was read one verse, and God is the answer. But, like many people, they're afraid to even open up the book. And God has sustained this book for all of us. It was written by Moses, 1450 to 1400 BC, and it's still with us today. So the big idea today is, God has not forgotten the Jewish people, and he still has a plan for their salvation and the salvation for everyone who lives on this earth. And so now we're going to delve deeper into how we answer this mystery. There's been a partial hardening of the Jewish people. That's a reality, and he's talking about it before it actually, actually happened. And we're going to look at what does it mean, a partial hardening. He says, until the fullness of the Gentiles. Well, in this case, not Gentiles, but the Gentile church. How does that kind of balance with the hardening of the Jewish people? And then all of Israel will be saved. And we're going to take a look at this mystery. When I first became a believer in Yeshua, can you say Yeshua? Very good. Yeshua is actually Jesus' Hebrew name. Yeshua means salvation is from the Lord. And I was being trained to go into Jewish ministry, and I was doing it in New York, and growing up in Boston, I hated New York. I hated everything about them. And I went there to train, and I thought after a year, I would be trained in New York and then deployed somewhere else. And then my boss came to me and said, Mitch, I get some good news and bad news. The good news is we're going to continue to work together. The bad news for you is you have to stay as a Bostonian in New York. And I hated it. And I went home that night and I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, I, I will serve you, but I really don't want to stay in New York. I don't like it here. And then it wasn't audible, but I got the sense that God was telling me a diehard Red Sox fan, he whispered in my ear, root for the Yankees. <laughs> I went, no, nah, I didn't hear you, God. He said, root for the Yankees. Now, that meant I had to root for Derek Jeter, Mario R Rivera, I mean, Joe Torrey. I had to root for them. I said, all right, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here, but I'll trust you. And I started to root for the New York Yankees. But keep that kind of quiet, okay? Because <laughs> as a diehard Red Sox fan, that was almost impossible to do. Now, why would God want me to do that? Because later on, I realized rooting for the New York Yankees made me a New Yorker, which I had to be if I was going to do ministry in New York. But God knew the answer. I didn't. It was a mystery to me until later on I looked back on my life and I realized I love New York City now. I love my 10 years that I spent there and I realized something. If you don't have a love for the people that you're trying to reach, you're never going to reach them. So you have to have a love. And here, Paul is saying, if the church, if you're going to have a desire to reach Jewish people, you better love them. And so we're going to go through how he asks you to love the Jewish people so that you can reach them with the good news because the church has a plan in that and the text is going to be unveiled for you to know how to do that. Amen? So <clears throat> let's turn to uh, text again, and we're going to look at the first mystery. Has God rejected the Jewish people? Let me just reiterate what we read before. 
in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I asked then, did God reject his people? Now, in light of the fact that there's a partial hardening of the Jewish people, it might seem to be maybe not the answer. Did God reject the Jewish people? Well, he didn't reject them. He just hardened them partially. Because Paul says, by no means, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant. God has not rejected the Jewish people totally. There's a partial hardening. How do you know that? Because, as Pastor John said, I'm Jewish. I am part of the remnant that was not hardened. So even though there's a partial hardening, not everybody is in that. And God is always, always, as Paul writes in Romans 11, he is from the tribe of the Jewish people. I am from the tribe of the Jewish people, and God has used me. So even though there's a partial hardening, God has not rejected the Jewish people. And he's going to give us a clue on how the church should handle this, because it almost looks like they have. Okay, my growing up, uh, my dad more than I did heard almost on a daily basis from those who didn't have a good handle on this scripture verse. He was always told, the Jews rejected Jesus, so God rejected you. Because when my dad was growing up, it almost seemed like no Jewish people believed. So imagine being told that from those who Supposedly believed in Jesus. God rejected the Jews as they worship the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> God rejected you guys because you rejected the Messiah. And what Paul said that it was to come true, that the church would start to believe that, not only believe it, but start to preach it. So if you're trying to win Jewish people to the Lord, you can't sit there all the time and say, God rejected you. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Paul tells us in verses 28 and 29. So listen to this. Paul says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they're the enemies. In a sense, what he's saying is the Jewish people were chosen to be a light to the world. In Isaiah, it says, you've been chosen to be a light to the goyim, the Gentiles. The Jewish nation was chosen for one reason. Exodus 19, God says to Moses, tell the people, will they be a nation of priests to the world? And if you're a whole nation of priests, then you stand in front of all the other nations. We were chosen to be the torchbearer. Not just that God existed, but to bring the message. So in one sense, the Jewish nation did reject when Jesus came. And the reason is, is because the Jewish people back then and today are looking for a different type of Messiah. They weren't looking for the Messiah that Jesus represented. They weren't looking for a suffering servant. They weren't looking for a Lamb of God. They're looking for a King David. And that's even true today. The Messiah that the average Jewish person is looking for is going to be like a King David who will defeat their enemies physically. The reality is, is that we have to defeat the enemy spiritually. And that's what the cross does. That's what the gospel does. So Paul says, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. The Jewish people have not been rejected because God's calling on the Jewish people is irrevocable. It cannot be turned around. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant. God gave Abraham a land, he gave him a people, and he gave him a plan to bring in the Messiah. It's irrevocable. So nobody can say that God rejected the Jewish people because Paul is saying, here's your defense. It's an everlasting covenant that God made with the Jewish people. We can't reject it because whether we agree with the total plan or not, it's the plan of God. Amen? Amen. Okay. And 
But you have to understand there's a partial hardening and the best illustration for me is to use a butterfly. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I, I don't know much about butterflies, but I looked this up and so there's four different stages of a butterfly life. A butterfly lays larva and five days later they hatch and become a worm. Caterpillar stage is a worm-like stage of the butterfly or moth. It often has an interesting pattern of stripes and patches and it may have the spine-like hairs. It is the feeding and growing stage and as it grows it sheds its skin four or more times so as to enclose it in a rapidly growing body. The next stage is called the pupa. Caterpillar is done growing and will spin a hardening protector around it as it morphs into a butterfly. So is God done with the butterfly? No, but it's partially hardened from the elements on the outside until God has a purpose. And that's kind of how you have to see the Jewish people. We're kind of in this, what they call the chrysalis stage, the pupa. We have this hardening protection around us, and God is doing it, and he's doing it for a reason, because he wanted it to be part of his plan of calling in the Gentiles. Who would have thought that the goal of the Jewish Messiah was to reach the ends of the earth? So we're still in that chrysalis stage as Jews. And now we have to answer the second question. If God has not rejected the Jewish people, then the second question is, has he replaced the Jewish people with the church? And again, we want to read Romans chapter 11, verse 11. As Paul says, again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, now listen to this, to make Israel jealous. The partial hardening of the Jewish people has created a plan of God to take the Gentiles and form the church. And you know what the goal of the church is? To make Israel envious. That's your mission statement. That's a pretty high calling for a church, isn't it? I want to ask you, if a Jewish person came into this church, would they be jealous? I want you to think about that. Okay, because again, not only growing up did my dad hear that God rejected the Jewish people because they rejected Jesus. He heard God replaced them. The Jews are done, and now God replaced them with the church. Not true. We work together. Okay, and there's more and more Jewish people who have come to faith in almost every congregation I visit now. We're a mixture of a whole bunch of people, and guess what? Um, that mixture becomes both Jew and Gentile, okay? I don't know, if is there anyone else here from a Jewish background other than me? Not here this morning, but I'm going to guess if I came back at 12.30 and I talked to the Ukrainian church that comes here, I bet you there's a few Jewish people that probably is part of that congregation, which in a sense is part of this church. So every church now, there's a combination here. It's, it's, it's a mixed remnant where we have both Jew and Gentile and that church that God has now formed to take the gospel out, one of your missions is to make Jewish people jealous. You can't get around it. So God has not replaced the Jewish people with the church. He's just using the church because in Romans 11.25, he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles. So what does that term mean, until the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, there's a couple of different ways theologically to look at how God is going to use the church. Because from Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, now Gentiles are being called in. 
until the fullness of the Gentiles. It's an interesting term, and there's a lot of different meanings. We'll discuss this later when we go down to the Bible study, but I just want to share with you that there'll be a time where God will stop using the church as it is, and a lot of us are in that camp would believe is when the rapture happens. Because what is the rapture? The rapture is God taking up the believers, the church, and then if the rapture happens, who's left on the earth? Those who do not believe. But here's the message of the church. If we look back at Romans chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, here's what God wants the church to do to make Jewish people jealous. For God's, um, just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy. Now what does that mean? It means the Gentiles weren't part of God's plan way back when. But God showed mercy by sending the Messiah so that you could be saved. And what he's telling the church is, you need that to be an example. If God saved you when you didn't even realize he was doing it, how much more should you go out and show other people mercy? And you know what the greatest gift of mercy is? Why we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. You know what's amazing about sharing the gospel? We can share it with anybody at any time. Nobody can ever say, well, you don't know my situation. I've done stuff so bad that God would not save me. False. God wants to save you. And God can, can forgive you for all of the sins that you've done in the past, present, and even in the future, and that's mercy. Listen to this illustration. A mother approached Napoleon, seeking a pardon for his son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice and demanded to be killed. The mother explained, I'm not asking for justice, Napoleon. I'm looking for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon said. Sir, the woman said, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. The reality of the gospel is we are all separated from God because of our sin. We can't work our way back there physically. We need help. And God has every right to judge us all on our sins and we would all fail. Mercy is getting something we don't deserve. We don't deserve it, but God loves us so much that he gives us to us. So here's how you make Jewish people jealous. You get to tell them, I want you to know what your Messiah did for me. The Jewish Messiah, Jesus, saved me. And he can save you and let me show you how it's done. You forgive, uh, you ask God for forgiveness for your sins. You ask God that, I can't do it on my own and I need help. And you thank God for sending his son to die for your sins. The gospel message is the greatest gift of mercy that the world can ever receive because we don't deserve it, but we get to give it. Amen? And then finally, the last one. Has God removed the Jewish people from his plan? No. He hasn't rejected them. He hasn't removed them. Because why? Because God has a plan in the future to use the Jewish people. He says, a partial hardening of the Jewish people until the fullness of the Gentile, which I believe is the rapture, and then all Israel will be saved. So here's the mystery. What does it mean all Israel will be saved? That's a very interesting term. Okay, and again, some of these terms have been misused by churches and even misunderstood from Jewish people, okay? Because in this case, again, I'll use my dad as an illustration. He's been told by some of his 
Christian friends, well, the church has to save every Jewish person or Jesus won't come back. And that was the basis of forced conversions over the course of hundreds of years of the church, right? Because again, they didn't understand the mystery that Paul was laying out here. It's not did yet, we don't force conversion on anybody. It's not the church doing it, it's God. There's a partial hardening of the Jewish people. God still has a remnant, but he's using the church. When the rapture happens, who's left? Jew and Gentile who have not come to believe in Jesus. And those in the dispensational world would call this the beginning of the tribulation period. Seven years for God to make himself known to the world. And guess who God is going to use in the end time to proclaim the gospel? The Jewish people. The end time is going to be a great time of revival, and God is going to use the Jewish people to do it. I know it almost seems strange, but the butterfly that laid a worm, that now put a hardening shell around the pulpa, will now be hatched and become a beautiful butterfly. And in the end time, God is going to resurrect the role of the Jewish people to preach the gospel in the end times. Now, I wish I had time to go through everything this morning from here, but we'll examine that in the Bible study too, because it's very interesting how God is going to use the Jewish people in the end times. I'll give you a little taste, right? Because in the book of Revelation, it says that God will seal 144,000 Jewish people. Now, they're not Jehovah Witnesses. And if there's a Jehovah Witness listening, I just want you to know that God loves you, but you did not replace the Jewish people. Because it actually doesn't say 144,000. It literally says 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. The 144,000 are Jewish people who God will use in the end time to preach the gospel. Uh, isn't that glorious and wonderful? And he's going to call back his people and he's going to allow them. And then I'm not going to say everything is glorious because the tribulation means there's a lot of trouble. But at the end, when Jesus comes back, there's a remnant of the Jewish people left. And every one of that, as Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 says about a future event about the son of David who comes back on the clouds and it says, they will look at me whom they have pierced. At that point, whether you're a believer or not yet, the Jewish people who are all left will instantly know when Jesus comes back from the clouds, how will the world know it's Jesus? I often tell a story, I might be sitting next to an Orthodox Jew so when the Messiah comes on the clouds of heaven, he'll say, oh, look at the Jewish Messiah. And I'll say, nope, that's, that is the Jewish Messiah, but he already came the first time and he's coming back and his name is Yeshua. Now we don't have a picture of Yeshua, so how do we know who it is? I want you to see how smart God is. What did he tell Thomas to do? Put his hands, and the past months. That's why the scripture in Zechariah 12, 10 says what? They will look at me whom they have pierced. When Jesus comes back on the clouds and we see his pierced marks, there will be no doubt not only the Jewish people will know who he is. One last chance for every person on this earth to come to believe in Yeshua. And then that will be what I believe the time when all of Israel will be saved. With the sound of the strings, symbols and heart, we praise you, we praise you. With the timbrel and dance and shouts to you, Lord, we praise you, we praise you. With new songs from our hearts, 
worshipful call.